was cracking, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Prison Break Raw. I'm your host, the one and only Big JD. As many of you already know, and as a lot of you have been asking me about, Michael Lynn Thompson, the infamous Aryan Brotherhood dropout that had been incarcerated since 1973 for murdering a couple of drug dealers. What do I think about him? Do I regard him as being a full-fledged, total, outright snitch, turncoat, and all that shit? A lot of these answers may surprise you, but I'm going to break all this down in a fair and unbiased way from everything that I know about him, everything that I've heard about him, why he was able to get paroled as opposed to Boxer Enriquez that is still being denied, and everybody keeps blaming the evil, evil white supremacist justice system as being biased and everything else. We're going to compare the character of the two, and you'll kind of see why. Thompson was able to get out, and Boxer will continue to rot away in that place probably until his dying day. So let's go ahead and get into a little bit of the history of Michael Thompson himself. What is he about? Who is he? What was his attitude, his character like? How did he carry himself in there? I got a lot of firsthand information, although I've never met Michael Lynn Thompson myself. But I have talked to people that have. My mother's oldest brother, Guy Hagman, actually was in and out of the justice system in the 70s around the time that Michael Thompson was going through there. And my uncle Guy had actually known Michael Thompson personally because they shared a lot of the same interests as far as rodeo and football and sports and everything is concerned. They had a lot of the same interests in a lot of ways. They were a lot the same kind of guy. I mean, Michael Thompson was no street thug. He was no street gangster. He was like a country boy from up in Northern California way. He was a uh, bull rider in the rodeo, football player, everything as you know. Got caught up in some case, killed a couple of drug dealers. I mean, he's a big dude, man. He's a big dude, and he's considered to be a pretty, pretty dangerous guy. I mean, he knows how to throw them hands. He knows how to defend himself quite well, which was why he ended up on the AB radar in the first place. T.D. Bingham, of course, seen him and said, we got to have this guy. Need people like him in this organization. I mean, back then, they used to keep the circle very small, very compact, And in a lot of ways, it was ran like an organization for protection, number one. And number two, it was an enterprise as well. I mean, of course, they're going to try to benefit themselves in any way possible. And with that benefit would come benefit that would be filtered back towards their families and stuff. A lot of these guys had put some of their kids through college with a lot of this money that they made. And... Family members are able to buy homes, get off their, get on their feet. A lot of stuff. You know, a lot of these guys came from dirt, poor, white trash backgrounds. Never really had much. Some of them were in the system long before, even before they were in puberty. So they had a lot of morals and a lot of codes and a lot of rules. They didn't tolerate, like, sex offenders, people turning their backs on them, people talking too much like cameras and all that stuff like that, and getting out there and bragging and boasting was definitely a no-no in these people's circle, and you would be killed for that. Or even invoking their name in order to instill fear in other people, and you may not be at that level with them. Of course, they're going to probably have you murdered as an example for why you maintain the code of silence, of which has been long forgotten in this day and age. With this new age man that believes that they could just get on camera and talk about whatever they want, expose game and all that shit like that. Michael Thompson comes from a time and an era where that was just a straight outright no-no. So Michael Thompson's case, of course, I don't really know all the gruesome details of it, but he killed a couple of drug dealers and that landed him in the California Department of Corruptions and Rehumiliation for a period of life. With the possibility of parole, of course. Going in there as a fish, being a white inmate in the California Department of Corruptions and Rehumiliation, especially back in those days, when it was far less political and far less organized as far as racial politics are concerned in the prison system, 
a white inmate can go in there and the other whites, especially the elite, the cream of the crop ones, the warriors or outlaws as they like to call themselves, would watch you and see how you respond to other races trying to push up on you, trying to rape you, trying to rob you, trying to lure you in to be their kid and all that stuff. So Michael Thompson was no exception. He came in there and right off the bat was the BGFs or blacks were trying to press up on him where he ended up going out to the yard and just letting him have it. After he'd finally got out of whatever isolation or disciplinary ad seg that he had probably had put him in, that's when T.D. Bingham had approached him and said, we want you. So they put him up on this pedestal as young Mike gave him that handle and he ended up becoming a full-fledged member of the Aryan Brotherhood, and the rest is history. So this guy was actually a lot smarter than a lot of other people that were in the system. He was already, like I said, well-educated. He came from a normal family background, all whatnot. Football player in the rodeo. I mean, you look at his old pictures and stuff, wearing his Caterpillar hat and stuff like that. Typical country, good old boy type of uh attitude and his demeanor and the way he carried himself was always very quiet respectful I mean the way that he speaks now is the way that he's always spoken as far as from what I'm told like I said getting information from an uncle that my mother mother's older brother guy who had done time with him and stuff like that and other people that had come across him in years before he had dropped out, had said that he'd always been very calculated, thought everything through, very well focused as far as planning and everything is concerned. I mean, it was his idea to lure in Charles Manson, and you saw what that was. I mean, they were getting the the top-of-the-line type of weaponry that was brought in through Manson's girls and whatnot, the money and everything that was involved, the drugs and everything. It's kind of what put the AB up there on top. And then the next step for them to do was to expand and to grow and to go up into the federal system and all that. And that's where Baron Mills and and Thomas Silverstein and the rest of them had actually expanded that outwards. And the AB had spread to many other states out there, although the two factions, the federal faction and the state faction are the only actually the righteous brand, California brand, the rest of these Organizations that you see across the state that take the name Aryan Brotherhood are not actually a part of the brand itself. But Thomas, um, or actually Michael Lynn Thompson, was the one that came up with a lot of these ideas. He was a lot, in a lot of ways, the brains. Like I said, very well spoken, very calm. His demeanor was always real relaxed and kicked back. He spoke real softly. I mean, if you ever listen to some of his interviews, you could see that that's how he was. And he subscribed to the old code, the way that it was in the beginning, before it just got out of hand and then started turning into all these different people that were in charge and whatnot. And Michael Thompson's own story, and I mean, there's nothing to dispute it as far as CDC records, IGI, or anything like that to dispute any of this or to think that he actually had a hit on him or that that he, that he was in hot water or he was looking to bail himself out. I mean, he didn't turn into a traditional rat the way most rats turn into. Like, let's say, for example, Boxer, right? Boxer didn't just one day wake up in his cell and have a change of heart and change of conscience and all this and that like Michael Lynn Thompson did. So that was kind of the, the bonus points, the favorite points in, in Michael Thompson's um favor to possibly being paroled down the line, whereas opposed to Boxer, like I said, we'll do the comparison, the side-by-side comparison so that you understand all this. So there was a hit that was put out on a guy that got out and they ended up just executing the man's father. Well, according to Michael Lynn Thompson's own story, he didn't like that. That wasn't what he signed up for. That wasn't what the brand was supposed to be. That wasn't you know, those kind of things were, were always considered to be a no-no. I mean, even even the big homies had, had one with that murder that happened in the valley that one time of that guy where the baby was killed and all that fool from character character from, from Sangre when he had basically shot the baby in the crib and all that stuff like that. 
all those kind of things to both of these organizations have always been considered to be off limits. Family is off limits. You don't mess with people's kids. You don't mess with people's fathers or mothers, sisters, brothers, anything like that. Right? You always bring it directly to them. And if you can't get them, you just got to basically work a little harder and hustle and, and get out there until you can eventually get to that individual. So when this happened with the guy's father, that's pretty much what set the alarm off in Michael Thompson that things were just becoming too large. You know, it was. it's always better to have a smaller group of just a few guys. I mean, when I was, like I said, when I was running around banging that UTK and everything back in the days, we were just a small little group of dudes. You knew who everybody was. You knew if somebody was talking, you could pretty much figure out who's doing the talking. Everything like that. But when something gets too large, you got all these weenies and all these weak people and weak character type people that get involved, that get in there. And and the more you spread yourself, the thinner you become. And the more thinner you become, the more holes that could be busted right through your whole organization. And this is how Michael Thompson saw it. And it was an eye-opener for him. So he decided that his only way out was to become an informant for the system itself. Now, I'm not going to really sit here and pat Michael Thompson on the back for becoming an informant, right? I'm just not going to do it. I mean, the way I always look at things is like, you know what you signed up for. I mean, he had proved how strong he was. He had proved that he was no punk. He proved that he could pretty much stand on his own two feet. I mean, not every white inmate in the system was a member of the brand. You got to remember there was a small group of guys with thousands of inmates in that place. He didn't have to sign on, right? And as smart as he is and as smart as he was then, and the way that he carries himself and the way he looks at life is like chess, 10 moves ahead, He should have been able to see the writing on the wall and he should have been able to see that at some point in time, this may be something that I can no longer embrace. You know what I mean? So why sign on to that? He should have probably just declined. But he signed on because of the flash and the lure and the popularity and not happen to constantly go at it with somebody or people just separate a path and let you walk right through. You get all the perks and everything out of it. He wanted to make his time comfortable. He believed that his life was going to be inside that place forever. He probably never thought he was going to get out. And I think that the reason why he's been in there so long is the fact that he became a part of that organization. So you're not really going to get any sympathy points for me as far as any of that is concerned. I mean, the way everything works in the criminal world is eventually there's going to be collateral damage, you know? And a lot of people look at these organizations as being scumbags, but the most largest and most disciplined and well-funded criminal organization in the world, which is the United States government, has been killing civilians for a long time, centuries, since its founding. So when a lot of people like to be hypocritical and look at this as being oh all all bad, killing innocent people and stuff, our own government has been killing women and children for a very long time, and our own government actually has mass exterminated a whole population of innocent women and children with dropping two atom bombs on Japan. So you're never going to get me to go against one without going against the other. It's all the same ball of wax, just on a smaller scale, on a micro scale, as opposed to a macro scale. But as far as him deciding to become an informant and turning them all in and going against the grain and everything, I mean, he could have simply have just pushed the issue. You know, whoever made the call or whoever actually carried out that hit to kill him, and say that we don't we don't condone this kind of shit and you're not going to be killing innocent people. You're not going to be killing family members and stuff like that. So, 
he could have done a lot to change the direction that it was going because he was one of the top. But it was his one voice against, I believe, three others. But he could have pushed the issue. He could have tried to change things. He could have changed the direction and all. But what that would have ultimately have done, and I'm pretty sure Michael Thompson had thought this through, ultimately that probably would have gotten him whacked at some point in time. You know, you're just the, you're the minority as far as what the majority feels and what the majority thinks. And like I said, this new age thinking that was coming and this going harder than everybody else and being more vicious and more ruthless, being that they're the smallest minority in the system itself, meant that they were willing to do anything and everything, and that was the message. But Michael Thompson wasn't with, wasn't with all that. Like I said, he wasn't a gangster. He's just a country boy. So he found his way out. He became an informant. And he changed his whole life around. So when he went off to S and Y and places like that, now this is where, like I said, the difference between him and Boxer is going to come into play, and you'll understand it. And you'll move away from this bullshit, the white supremacist justice system or whatnot. That's why Michael Thompson got out. And that's why Boxer's not out. It goes like this, people. When Michael Thompson got out, he got out. He was done. When he went to the S&Y, he started working on a blueprint for helping people break free from gangs, the destructive lifestyle, and do all that stuff like that. He's now pretty much the leader of a nonprofit organization called Live, Learn, and Prosper. Almost like Live Long and Prosper for... Mr. Spock, I'm pretty sure he's a fan. He carries himself like Mr. Spock. Have you ever listened to any of his interviews? So his whole personality and the way he carried himself while he was in SNY, what he was involved in, all the programs he took, all the people that he was assisting and helping and the things that he was doing is what pretty much bought him his freedom. As opposed to Boxer. Okay. Boxer didn't get out of the organization because of the same reason that Michael Thompson did. As a matter of fact, Boxer was well aware of what had happened that one night back in, what was it, 1996 or 97 with character from Sangres that had did what he did, killing the baby and everything like that. That wasn't enough to change Boxer. And that wasn't the only time that innocent people were getting Smoked and rushed up on in a lot of ways. So Boxer was still heavily involved in using heroin and all that stuff like that and making the money and doing what he was doing, wheeling and dealing. But it got to be some point to where people were hating on Boxer and they were looking to get rid of him. Boxer knew that he was dead. So Boxer dropped out. He had turned, spilled the whole beans, was was basically... The grandfather, Takashi 69 told everything, told all, told, and continues to tell and continues to write books because he's trying to win his freedom. He's trying to get out. And everything that Boxer does is for the purpose of getting out. Michael Thompson, his mindset was, if I get out, I get out. If I don't, I don't. He's got a spiritual grounding and, and the way that his mind runs and he started getting a lot of uh, traditional Native American spirituality and whatnot. Boxer did not. Boxer's whole push and everything he does is to get out. Michael Thompson, on the other hand, not so much, but he ended up getting his freedom. Boxer, immediately after all his testimony and, and, and being involved in writing the Black Hand book and everything like that, was using a lot of the proceeds that he made to get high and to chase big butt boys around the Lancaster Honor Yard. Uh, the Lancaster Yonor, uh, Honor Yard. Yeah. Chasing around big butt boys and getting high and falling into a downward spiral has basically been boxer ever since. So the two comparisons are, is it... The government in the state of California looks at the two people as Michael Thompson had actually proven that he had remorse, insight, and everything else. 
The things that he was doing in there in order to better himself and whatnot, it actually won his freedom as opposed to boxer chasing big butt boys and still getting high and is probably still doing that to this very day. Last I heard, he's trying to work on another book. Must be running out of money. So you see the difference. It has nothing to do with white supremacy or anything like that. It has to do with the way the system looks at these individuals. And I mean, Gavin Newsom is as far away from as a white supremacist as, as you can get. But they look at the two side by side and they look at what you do in there. Your insight, your remorse, your actions, the way you carry yourself, what you've been involved in while you went to SNY and did everything that you did. And now look at Michael Thompson's out and he's involved in his nonprofit organization and his whole purpose is to help people and stuff and you can't fault him or take that away from him. As far as him being a snitch or a rat, yes, he's a snitch. Yes, he's a rat. So, I mean, you basically fill in the blanks and you decide how you would look at a person like that. I could basically look at a person like that in two ways. Yes, you're a snitch. Yes, you're a rat. You know what you signed up for. On the other hand, you're doing a lot of good work and you're trying to help people. So it kind of balances the two out. Would I ever fuck with somebody like that? You know... I haven't had him contacting me. I haven't had any of his people ever contact me or anything like that. When that day ever comes, I'll basically have an answer for you. But for right now, don't have an answer. You already know what it is. And you heard it right here. Prison break raw, uncut, uncensored, no holds barred, non sugar coat, not politically correct, all up in your face, slapping you with that dick of reality. And I'm out. <laughs>